Okay, let's start over. Um, as I was saying, uh, my name is Darjeeling Smegdov. I'm a FreeBSD developer and an engineer at the University of Oslo in Norway. I've been uh, working uh, with uh, security and authentication for both professionally and as a FreeBSD developer, and sometimes those two have overlapped uh, for over 10 years now. Um, what I'm here to talk about is, um, basically I'm here to tell you that we're doing it wrong. And we've been doing it wrong all along. So the title of my presentation is Challenges in Identity Management and Authentication. And I'm, I'm here mostly with questions, or mostly with, I'm here mostly to point out what we're doing wrong, but I also have some ideas on how we could do it right. First, some, uh, some uh, terminology, um, just to make sure that we uh, all understand each other. Uh, identification or identity, well, I, in, in a broader sense, identity management is the, the act of, or the, the, the fact of knowing who a person is or who a user is and knowing things about that user, such as their username, their, uh, their UID, their, um, their real name, uh, things like that. Uh, authentication is the act of verifying that a person who claims to be a specific user is actually, or, or that a, a principal who claims to be a, a specific uh, user actually is that user. Authorization and access control are often confused. Um, I, I have made that mistake myself of, of saying authorization when I actually mean, mean access control. Uh, um, access control is the act of verifying that the person you have in front of you is actually allowed, is actually authorized to do what that person uh, is now trying to do or asking you to do for them. Um, Authorization is actually the act of granting those permissions. Uh, but it is commonly, the word, that word is commonly used to mean access control. So, step into my time machine. These are, I'm sure you, I hope you can read them. I'm sure you recognize them. These are ETC password entries. Um, for roots, um, showing how they have evolved over time. So the top line is a plain V7 Unix ETC password line with a death hashed password. And incidentally, the salt is salt and the password is password, I think. I don't remember generally in, in, in all examples. The second one is a BSD uh, master password line, which as you can tell has extra fields. It has a login class, which is empty, and, and a password expiry time and an account expiry time. And this time I used extended des uh, hashing, which is a, a different hash function. And below that is the same line, but with the MD5 hash and then the SHA uh, 512 hash that we use today in uh, current. So here is five, five lines. Well, if you don't count, uh, if you don't count uh, error checking and if you don't count the printf at the end that just says welcome, uh, it actually takes in, in a traditional uh, V7 Unix or in the traditional Unix word, traditional, traditional ETC password world, it only takes two lines to identify and authenticate a user. Um, this is a slightly more complex version of the same code. I've just added two lines which check the expiry time. So now we've gotten to, now we've gone from there to there. And, and um, this final version does a, a lot more because it also does a little bit of access 
uh, of access control. Um, after identifying and authenticating the user and verifying that the account hasn't expired, which is not really authentication and not really of access control, it's some, somewhere in between, it's account management, or something like that. Um, what I do next is that I check that the user is a member of the group staff, and that's access control. That's a, 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 an access control policy. I now know that the user is who they say they are, but I want to know if that user, knowing that it is them, is that user allowed to do what they're trying to do now? Okay. So, if we move forward a bit, this is the copy. This is a copy of. You probably recognize it. NSSwitch.conf. This one was taken from FreeBSD 5.3, which is when it was introduced. Um, and what NSSwitch.conf introduced was. Um, modularized identity system because we now had um, different ways of retrieving information about a user, of identifying a user. We actually had already had different ways of doing it before, but it was hard-coded. Um, so you had ETC password, and then if you had a plus at the end of the file, you'd check NIS and possibly uh, Hesiod, um, uh, so DNS. But um, NSS brought us modularization. It, it, is now poss it was now possible to uh, install plugins which would handle different. So you could install an LDAP plugin, for instance. Still can. Um, this is login.conf from FreeBSD 4.3, which is not when that functionality was added, but it's when we actually started using it uh, for more than, than just, well, this is when we started making extensive use of it. I'm not going to talk too much about login.conf. It actually doesn't have anything to do with authentication. It's actually part of, it should be viewed as, as part of the identity management system because um, except for this line uh, and an equivalent line somewhere above there, uh, all of this is just information about the user. It doesn't tell us anything about how to verify that the user is who they say they are. And if we keep moving forward in time, we get to FreeBSD. Um, this is from FreeBSD 5. It's uh, an excerpt from PAM.conf from FreeBSD 5. Uh, uh, five current, actually. This is. This was uh, uh, taken right before we switched to uh, PAM.d to the new configuration uh, layout for PAM. Uh, at that point, we had actually already had PAM since 3.1, but we didn't, it, it, it was only in, in uh, FreeBSD 5 that we started actually putting PAM into absolutely everything in the base system and, and using it for more than just a few uh, specific things. So we now have a PAM configuration that actually lists the entire traditional uh, Unix authentication policy. So you check no login and then you check the password and things like that. So, so the, the interesting thing is that both PAM and NSS came from Solaris. Um, and so we, we had PAM since 3.1 and we had move back. We had NS switch since 5.3, but NS switch is actually much older than PAM, but we didn't adopt it until much later for some reason. Um, this is the PAM equivalent of the code I showed you earlier. So we first have to initialize PAM and we tell PAM that we want to use a specific policy called system. And by convention, Normally, when you use PAM, uh, you use the name of the, of the application as the name of the policy, but you don't have to. Um, then we have one PAM uh, service call there, uh, which is PAM Authenticate. Uh, 
uh, which does pretty much the same as the line I had where I compared the uh, hashed password. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm not going, to, I, I'll actually, I'll come back to this code later, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. But you can tell that it is somewhat longer and more complicated, more complex than, um, than the, the old world equivalent. So I'm going to move on. Now I'm go actually going to start about talking about what's wrong, what we're doing wrong. By structural flaws, I mean flaws in the underlying model. I mean flaws in flaws that we can't just um, uh, flaws in how we think about it, as opposed to flaws in how we we do it. So let's begin with identification. This is. Um, a slightly redacted uh, dump of the um, publicly available information about me in the University of Oslo's LDAP directory, or in one of our LDAP directories, because we have several with varying levels of, uh, of, of detail. Um, and there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of information there uh, which won't fit in ETC password. For instance, there's a line there that says I'm an employee. There is, uh, there is um, a line there that gives my postal address. There are several lines there with my job title. And there are lines there which in a slightly roundabout way uh, actually encode in which department I work in. This is my University of Oslo web page, uh, except it isn't, I don't keep anything there. My phone number, uh, my street address, it doesn't have my, it doesn't have my office location. But. So there's a lot of information there that apart from maybe stuffing it in the Geekos field, um, uh, that you can't encode that in ETC password. And as a consequence, um, as a consequence, you can tell that so this, this is struct password. This is our current identification API. Our current identity API is get PW NAM and get PW UID, which returns a struct password, which, as you can tell, has no way of, there is no way to store that information in there. This is the equivalent for groups which is also part of identity management, knowing that a user is a member of a group. Um, so our group, our, our notion, concept of groups is extremely simple. Um, the, 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 the API we have, the way we have of the, the, the standardized AP, uh, interface we use for, for uh, uh, group querying group membership, etc. Um, it only pretty much only cares about file groups, so there are no, uh, there is no way to have a, uh, a group. There is no way to express. Um, sorry, there is there's no way to create a group uh, which has other groups as its members. For instance, there is no hier uh, hierarchy, um, and this is all we have. So unless you, unless you, you, um, I was going to use the word teach is probably not the, the correct word, but let's, let's just, unless you teach your application that, unless you tell, explicitly tell your application, your, unless your application has actually built in LDAP support and you tell your application that, hey, I'm actually using LDAP so you can use LDAP to look up additional information. There is no way for an application to get that information, even though we have NSS underneath, which supports LDAP. Um, in addition, um, there is no API for actually modifying this information. And the way we do it uh, in the traditional world, if we're, if we're still using ETC password, ETC master pa password, et cetera, um, uh, the way we do it is actually we edit the file and then we regenerate the database and we're doing it, we're, we're sort of 
when we do that, we're sort of mowing the grass under the application's feet. Um, there is no, well, the, 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 uh, the, the act of regenerating the database is a sort of atomic and there are locks in place, so uh, there, you shouldn't actually run into any conflicts. You shouldn't get uh, inconsistent information, but it's, it's really, it's a hack. And if you're using something else than ETT password, then you have to know what it is that you're using and you have to go there. If you're using LDAP, then you have to, there's no way to directly uh, make changes from an application that doesn't know that you are using LDAP. So we, the, the problem exists in both directions. This is um, login.conf again, um, which I'm bringing up again because when we found the need, and I'm, I'm saying we in, in a very wide sense because this actually predates FreeBSD, if I remember correctly, Kirk. Login.conf, login classes, do they predate FreeBSD? Yeah, they're from 4.4 or, or something. Um, so we decided that we needed to store more information about users. And instead of, instead of um, implementing a generic API for storing information about users, maybe for having you know, per user properties or something, um, what we got was a very specific API, very specifically named API and a very narrow API for a very specific type of information, which is resource limits and, and uh, paths and environment variables and things like that. It's a key value store, so yes, you could use it for pretty much everything, except that the file format is very limited. You can't, as you can tell, there, you can't uh, store a column in a field in login.conf, which is why the path here is space separated instead of column separated, and you have to do the translation. Uh, when you get that information from um, login, get cap, whatever. So, structural flaws in authentication and access control. Let's return to our PAM example. What you actually see happening in these few lines of code is authentication here, at least on the surface. Uh, some sort of access control there. Some sort of identity management there because actually when you, um, so when I, I start, I first initialize PAM and I tell PAM which policy I want to use and I also tell PAM which user I'm trying to authenticate. And the specification says the X uh, open single sign on blah blah which is the, the sort of standard uh, for PAM. Uh, actually says that a PAM module is allowed to modify that username so the application should ask, once authentication is complete, the application should ask PAM what the real login, what the real username is, uh, which is what we do here. And then we can do a get PW NAM, which goes to NS switch, which goes to whatever, maybe LDAP, we don't know. But what we do know is that it doesn't go through PAM because they're completely separate. Um, there is an additional, an additional um, a problem here though, which is that ostensibly we have some sort of authentication, some sort of access control here. But in fact, we have no idea what happens when you call PAM authenticate, when you call PAM account management. Um, I have a PAM configuration file here again, and uh, there's, uh, where did I take this one from? Um, there's a line I wanted to show you, which is PAM no login. So the thing is that actually in the authentication phase, in a, so in a, in a previous slide, there you can see the PAM no login line that's not authentication. That's checking if a file exists in ETC, and if that file exists, it means that we're preparing to shut down for maintenance or something, and we shouldn't allow people to log in at all. That has nothing to do with authentication. It could be construed perhaps as, ac as access control, but we're actually doing it in the authentication phase. And then we have PAM Unix, 
um, if I'd shown you the PAM configuration for um, if I'd shown you the PAM configuration for uh, uh, can this go any faster? If I'd shown you the the PAM configuration for uh, su or sudo, uh, you'd see that it checks um, uh, the, the, the PAM configuration for SU checks uh, that the user is a member of Wheel before it asks for the user's password, which is also backward, because verifying that the user is a member of Wheel is access control, and we should authenticate the user. So basically, we're, we're making a decision based on the identity of the user before we even know that that identity is correct, before we've even authenticated it. The reason why it's done like that. The reason why the PAM configuration for SU is like that is that that was a historical behavior. So when we PAMified SU, when we converted SU to use PAM, we just created a PAM configuration that approximated the historical behavior as closely, closely as possible. But you can also see that the, the, the syntax is extremely simple and there are many things that would be, that one would think were obvious requirements that we have no way of doing. There is no way, for instance, to tell PAM that I want at least two out of these authentication mechanisms to succeed. And I have no way of telling PAM that, for instance, if you're logging in on the console, it should accept, uh, it should, uh, accept uh, one of them. I mean, if you're logging in on the console, your password is enough. But if you're logging in remotely, I want you to also provide a one-time code or an SSH key in addition to your password. There is no way uh, to express that in the PAM configuration syntax. Linux PAM has a slightly more complex syntax, but it can't do that either. It's only a, they, they have a, a, um, some sort of flow control. They can, they can control, they have a slightly more fine-grained control over when um, a PAM returns instead of continuing down the, the, uh, down the down the list. So, so what I was uh, saying about um, uh, uh, having different requirements based on where the user is logging in from, etc., is such an obviously useful feature that OpenSSH, this is an excerpt from the OpenSSH man page, OpenSSH actually has a fairly, uh, fairly complex a configuration mechanism for expressing um, that sort of policy. Uh, you have um, uh, match groups where you can, you can, uh, you can. So you have conditionals. You can um, uh, match based on the username, based on the uh, group name, on where um, you're logging in from, which can be either a host name or an address, and you have a long list of of uh, knobs that you can tweak based on that condition. So as in a more, uh, uh, th this is OpenSSH specifically, but uh, more generally, OpenSSH isn't the only application to do that. So what, what, we, what we've ended up with is we have a centralized authentication policy which is so inexpressive that many authentication and access control decisions have actually been decentralized, or rather, they haven't, they should have been centralized but haven't been because, because there is no good way of doing it. And so we have, if you have 15 different applications, then you have the PAM configuration syntax plus 15 different configuration syntaxes for each of these applications with different concepts and different ways of expressing it and different levels of functionality plus probably several additional, you have for instance um, hosts.allow TCP wrappers in addition. I mean OpenSSH is out of the box supports TCP wrappers. So you can do access control at any even lower level. Um, although you, you could view TCP wrappers as more part of the um, 
part of the firewall, really, and not part of the authentication or access control system. I don't know, network level access control. So I'm going to speak very briefly about technical flaws, uh, by which I mean um, uh, not, so I've been talking about conceptual flaws and, and um, technical flaws. By technical flaws, I mean flaws in the way the tools we do have work, the way they're implemented. So just very briefly, this is the PAM conversation API. This is how a PAM module communicates with the user. This is how a PAM module asks, um, asks a user a question and receives the answer from the user. And you can ask several questions. You can pass messages, and you can uh, pass prompts, and you can receive input from the user. Uh, it's somewhat limited, but actually quite flexible. Um, and it's done with a callback. When you, before you, when you, um, when you uh, initialize the PAM library before you start authentication, you have to register a conversation function, which is a callback which the module will call when it needs to communicate with the user. So this is what we call inversion of control. Here's a very simple, I should probably have added colors, uh, uh, depiction of, of, um, of uh, co the code path or the, the control flow when an application uses PAM to authenticate a user. So the application has an event loop. Let's say, for instance, that this is uh, SSHD. It has an event loop um, that it uses to exchange um, packets with, uh, with the, the SSH client. And at some point in that event loop, it decides that it needs to call PAM and authenticate the user. So it calls PAM authenticate, which goes into the dispatcher in the PAM library. And the dispatcher calls PAM modules one by one based on the PAM configuration. And suddenly, we get to a module here that wants to talk to the user. And what that module does is that it calls the callback function and waits for an answer. So the problem is, of course, that um, at this point, the event loop has actually stopped. The event loop is stalled, waiting for PAM Authenticate to return. But we're trying to perform an action which requires the event loop to run because we need to send packets to the SSH client and we need to receive packets with the answer. And that just plain can't work as long as the event loop is stalled waiting for PAM Authenticate to return. Actually, my first draft, when I, when I added PAM support to OpenSSH, my first draft actually ran the event loop from within the, uh, the PAM shim layer. So the event loop would call PAM, which would call the event loop. And it sort of worked because the event loop was sort of re-entrant, but it actually would have broken horribly with anything slightly more complicated than the very simple test cases I was using. So what we had to do was um, move PAM into a separate process so that the event loop communicates with the user and it communicates asynchronously and it communicates with PAM asynchronously through, a, call it a proxy, that there's a, a very thin layer that allows you to do a remote PAM procedure call. The problem is that PAM modules expect to run in the same process. They, they expect to be running in the, in the uh, in the process that will eventually, at some point, either perform an action on behalf of the user or um, fork and exec the user's shell or something. And in this case, it doesn't. In this case, it runs in a child process. And all sort of sorts of things mostly work, but only mostly. And for instance, uh, PAM modules can set environment variables, which will then be exported to the user's shell. 
But of course, if they do something like that, if they do, I mean, a, a PAM module that has a side effect that affects the process that actually calls the PAM module, those side effects will be lost because the process ceases to exist before OpenSSH starts the user's shell. Uh, environment variables were a poor example, by the way, because uh, the, the, um, the PAM integration code in OpenSSH actually transfers them back. So environment variables work. Uh, what doesn't work is, uh, or do they? Uh, no, they don't. The, the, uh, um, the PAM SSH module starts, is it? PAM, yeah, the uh, PAM SSH module starts an SSH agent on your behalf after you've authenticated. Uh, so the PAM SSH module is a module that allows you to authenticate yourself by typing in the passphrase to your SSH key. So you have an SSH key on the machine you're logging in on. So it's kind of backwards. It's not really intended to be used in conjunction with SSH, but it's, it's more like when you log in on, on uh, in X, for instance. So you type in your password and, uh, and or you type in your passphrase, SSH passphrase, passphrase instead of your password and you're logged in and you have an SSH agent and the SSH agent has that key loaded. In order for the SSH agent to have that key loaded, uh, the uh, PAM SSH module needs to either store that key after having successfully decrypted it using the passphrase you typed in, or it has to store the passphrase so that it can later decrypt the key again. And that doesn't work because that information is not transmitted from the part of OpenSSH that actually uh, runs the authentication bit and the part of OpenSSH that runs um, the session uh, establish uh, sec uh, section setup and section teardown bit, which are uh, parts of PAM that I haven't shown you. Oh, yeah, that was a red square highlighting the callback. I forgotten about it. So I am now going to, I believe I have about 15 minutes left, something like that. 10 minutes left, yes. So I have 10 minutes to talk about solutions. Um, I'm not going to outline a solution. Instead, I'm going, to, I'm going to outline some principles which should, uh, which we should follow when, when, optimistically, when we try to solve this, this uh, problem. So the first principle consolidates identity and authentication services. I mentioned this very briefly earlier. We have NSS, which is modularized identity management. We have PAM, which is modularized uh, authentication and to a certain extent account um, access control and to a certain extent uh, account management and a tiny little bit of identity management. It's a hodgepodge of Anyway, but they don't talk to each other. And there's no shared code. You have a, an NSS LDAP. Yeah, uh, if you're using LDAP and you're using LDAP authentication, which is a bad idea because it's based on storing the password out either in plain text or the hash password in the LDAP directory, which is a bad idea, but never mind that. Uh, uh, if you use those, then the LDAP NSS module and the LDAP PAM module are two completely separate pieces of software. The only thing they have in common is that they both use uh, the uh, open LDAP client library uh, to actually implement the LDAP protocol. Um, they don't communicate with each other. They don't cooperate in any way. Uh, so we need, we need, to, we need to merge this, these these two, we need, we need to have, um, we need to have a, a, a framework where the back end handles both identity management and authentication so that we can do things like, like this. Um, we need to centralize the authentication policies. Sounds obvious, but it's actually very difficult because what this means is we, we, can't, we can't hope to ever fully uh, uh, centralize 
all authentication decisions. Because there are things like public key authentication in OpenSSH. We can't move that into some framework somewhere because it's part of the underlying SSH protocol. It's so closely tied to the SSH protocol that you, you, it has to be implemented in the SSH server. But the decision of whether to use it, whether to require, uh, whether to ask for uh, a public key, whether to require a public key, or rather to require a sign challenge anyway, should be centralized. And that is actually possible because in SSH2, uh, you can, uh, there are multiple authentication mechanisms. You can use one or several, and you can use them in any order, and you can, uh, you can switch back and forth between them, and actually OpenSSH does that. If you look very closely at the logs, it will first run through the entire list. It, it will actually run through the entire list twice, and it does some, uh, um, uh, it runs through the list first to negotiate which ones to use, and then it runs through the list again to actually use them. And so so it, it, it would be possible if OpenSSH actually cooperates, if, if we have a, 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 a tight cooperation between the two, it, is, it should be possible for, for the, uh, the, the, the authentication framework to tell OpenSSH, hey, can you please do public key authentication now? And tell me whether that worked. Um, uh, it was, okay, never mind. Isolate identity and authentic authentication services from what I call exposed surfaces. Uh, if you're familiar with how OpenSSH does uh, privilege separation, or if you're familiar with the concept of privilege, privilege separation, then you'll understand what I mean. Um, identity management authentication are sensitive. Uh, uh, op, um, they, they require, for instance, access to, if you're doing traditional Unix authentication, then you need to be able to access ETC SPWD DB or ETC Shadow or whatever, ETC Master Password. Uh, you get the drift. And you really don't want to do that in the same process that also sp speaks to the user and could potentially contain a buffer overflow vulnerability or something or some sort of code injection vulnerability that would then allow the user to access that uh, uh, data store directly. You want to separate those things. OpenSSH does that with privilege separation. But you want to do that across the board. Um, for instance, Sue does not. It calls Pam directly, and it calls Pam. So it, it calls Pam and does potentially sensitive, potentially dangerous, dangerous things because before it knows that it can actually trust the, the or before it has a reasonable expectation of being able to trust the user. So. There are, there are uh, worse cases than ETC master password because that contains password hashes. But if you're doing uh, time-based um, time one-time passwords, for instance, if you're using Oath, uh, which is the same as Google Authenticator, uh, the, um, to, in order to verify the code that the user entered, you actually need the, the key that we use to generate it. So you actually have to store the key in plain text. Just like with Kerberos, you have to, the Kerberos, uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, key server. Yes, uh, the the, uh, the the server that grants the ticket granting ticket uh, actually has a co plain text copy of the of the password because it's based on encrypting. Uh, it's a zero knowledge uh, protocol based on encrypting a challenge with the password. Um, if we take this one step further. We, we can completely isolate authentication from the application entirely. So we no longer perform, we, don't, we, we no longer, we don't perform authentication and access control in a child, not even in a child process of the application like OpenSSH does. So instead we have a service, 
we have a daemon running um, uh, somewhere. And the application communicates with that daemon with some sort of remote procedure call interface. And that daemon provides identity management services, authentication services, very tightly controlled interface, complete separation between them. And we actually, that actually has, um, that actually gives us some advantages other than just improved security. It means that that um, service can cache information in a way that you can't do in OpenSSH where you're only going to do one uh, request at a time uh, and then lose your context. Um, and uh, sorry, we can also do something that uh, we can do a session setup and session teardown in a much better way than Pam does it and we can also do first open last close uh, operations. For instance, starting an SSH agent the first time the user logs in and then every subsequent, sub, subsequent time the user logs in, we just give the user information about the already running agent. But when the user finally logs out of all SSH sessions and whatever, then we kill the SSH agent. We can't currently do that with PAM because PAM does not have a, a, a big view. Uh, PAM only sees the, the exact Pam only sees one session at a time. It doesn't have. Um, and finally, we must dare to break or at least bend compatibility. FreeBSD, um, the principle of least astonishment, et cetera, backward compatibility, they're, they're good ideas, but I believe that sometimes FreeBSD takes them too far and that we're, we seem to be afraid of introducing, of making large changes and incompatible changes. And we have to dare to do that because uh, we, we have to dare to do that. We also have, and, and we have to, to, to dare, we have to trust our users to actually understand the need for it instead of instinctively being afraid that our users will hate us for introducing such a change. Of course we have to provide backward compatibility because we are not going to change every single application in the world to support our new framework if we develop such a framework. So we have to provide some sort of backward compatibility. We, we should ideally be able to use third-party PAM modules in some manner because, of course, people are going to write PAM modules for stuff that we don't want to necessarily want to implement in our base system. So we, we do have to provide backward compatibility. But we don't have to emulate every single little detail at the cost of actual functionality and, and at the cost of security, which we could have achieved if we dare to bend compatibility. And that was it, I think, great timing. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions? Yes? Is it a possible solution to embed something like free values into the operating system? That's interesting, but yeah, but Radius, uh, first of all, is very network oriented. Uh, so yeah, maybe you'd rewrite, uh, may maybe you'd take a Radius uh, server and rewrite it to communicate over Unix socket or something like that. Um, and, and Radius has some nice properties uh, such as support for, uh, uh, for uh, back and forth um, uh, conversations. So you can actually ask, you don't, you don't it's not, um, it can do challenge response and, and multiple, I mean, back and forth, ask you for your password, ask you for a one-time code and, and stuff like that. It's a nice protocol. Uh, but it's purely authentication. It's not identity management. So it breaks my first principle, which is that we have to consolidate identity management and authentication. Next question. Uh, didn't Apple do something in, in Darwin, kind of similar to Yeah. Um, I, uh, maybe I should have brought the, uh, so it's called CDDL, and I think the, uh, the specification it is 1,050 pages long. Um, I should have brought a printout <laughs> just to show you. Um, 
CDDL is actually, CDDL tries to do absolutely everything. It's not just authentication and identity management. I think it's also a, a, an entire crypto framework. So it sort of replaces OpenSSL and PAM and NSS and GSS API and whatever, pretty much everything. Oh, I forgot to mention GSS API because GSS API is something that we can absolutely not do with PAM because PAM can only, PAM is entirely text-based. And GSS API is something that we should support to a much larger degree than, than we do. So we have OpenSSH supports GSS API and Kerberos because it does them itself. Because PAM isn't capable of doing that. So thank you. Any further questions? No? Okay, well thank you for coming.